Welcome to the fourth iteration of the Plutus Pioneer Program. My name is Lars Brunjes. I'm the Director of Education at IOG, the company building Cardano. And some members of my education team at IOG and myself will be your instructors for this course. So for the course, we'll have weekly lectures that will be released every Thursday. And in addition to that, we'll have weekly Q&A sessions on every Tuesday. Now, of course, we realize that uh, you are all over the world. So some of you will be in time zones that will make it inconvenient for you to attend these Q&A sessions. But all of them will be recorded. And you will also have the option to ask questions in advance. So we'll try to, during the Q&A sessions, both answer pre-asked questions and live questions. And in addition to that, um, you have several other resources available. So there is a GitHub repo that will contain all the code, both for examples during the lecture, as well as homework, and also links and playbook, where you can read up on the lectures as well. Then we have a Discord for you, where you can ask questions and discuss. So actually, more than 3,000 people have already registered for this iteration of the program. So unfortunately, we'll probably not be able to answer all your questions individually. But in the past, in previous iterations of this course, actually, there was a lot of help amongst the pioneers. So a lot of the questions were answered by other pioneers. And I really liked that. So it was a great atmosphere of, of learning and collaboration. And I hope that uh, we will see the same in this course. But of course, my team and myself will also try to answer as many of your questions as possible. Then there's also Cardano Stack Exchange. So I ask all of you to ask questions there, especially if they are not directly concerning logistics of the course, but are more general Plutus questions that might be of interest for other people as well that try to learn Plutus. So this course obviously is all about Plutus, and Plutus is the native smart contract language of the Cardano blockchain. So if you want to develop a D app on Cardano, you will have to reach for Plutus. And in this course, you will learn all you need to get started um, writing your own smart contracts in Plutus and writing your own D apps. So in this lecture, after this introduction, my colleague Robertino will tell you how you can set up your environment. So in previous iterations, that was one of the biggest hurdles for pioneers, that it was quite tricky to actually get Plutus to compile in the first place. So we tried very hard to make the experience easier in this iteration. So we offer two options. One is basically a one-click browser environment. So we collaborate with TX Pipes, an Argentinian company that uh, provided a tailor-made environment for this course for you. So you can basically just in your browser do everything. So you'll be connected to a Cardano node and other infrastructure, uh, have a Haskell compiler available and an editor, and you can just work in the browser. In addition to that, we also provide a dev container for Visual Studio. So for those of you that prefer to work locally, that's also possible. And if Visual Studio code is set up correctly, it should be a matter of one click again to get a working environment with all the necessary dependencies installed. So we hope that this time will be much easier to get started. Then we'll have a demo, which will be presented by one of my other colleagues, Thomas just to showcase you what you will be able to do if you successfully finish this course, just to give you an idea of what is possible doing in Plutus. Then I'll give a brief refresher on two cryptographic primitives that are used all over the place, hashing and digital signatures. And then I'll explain the so-called EUTXO model, the extended unspent transaction output model which is the model that Cardano uses. And it's important to understand this model in order to do Plutus. 
in following lectures. We'll talk about all sorts of topics like um, on-chain, off-chain code. We'll talk about validators, about minting native assets in Plutus, NFTs, how to test Plutus contracts and how to deploy them to the actual blockchain or in our case, the testnet. We obviously have a plan for the rest of the lectures, but we also try to always be very flexible. So in the past, it has happened several times that during one of the Q&A sessions, some question or wish came up that we then incorporated into a later lecture of the course. And I like it that way. I like to keep it as interactive as possible. So it's possible that something comes up and we will then spontaneously change the plan for the lecture slightly to incorporate that. One thing about Plutus is that unfortunately, it's still not totally easy to learn. Things have improved a lot since I taught the first iteration of this course. So back then, for the first iteration, Plutus wasn't even live on the blockchain. So it was all somewhat theoretical. I mean, there were tools like the Plutus Playground that we could use to demonstrate Plutus contracts, but um, you couldn't deploy them to the actual blockchain. And even then in later iterations, when Plutus was actually live and usable on Cardano, it was still quite difficult to deploy anything because the tooling was very rudimentary. So I'm not saying that the tooling is ideal now, but it's certainly much better. And most importantly, a lot of projects have been deploying dApps on Cardano. And a lot of projects have come up with nice tooling for Plutus. So we'll see a lot of those third-party tools during this course. And because we have so many tools available now, it's much easier than it used to be. Nevertheless, it's still not as polished as in more established blockchains, like for example, Ethereum. And even though Plutus has been live for about one and a half years now, it's still very new. So there are still frequent changes, not as frequent as they used to be, but nevertheless, and Plutus is still changing and evolving. That's of course exciting because it means um, we can all explore all the new possibilities together, but it also means that it's sometimes, for example, difficult to find answers to questions online for other programming languages or things like Solidity on Ethereum. Uh, you easily can find an answer on Stack Exchange, for example. On Plutus, this is often not so easy. That's one of the reasons why we really encourage you to ask your question on the Cardano Stack Exchange to make it easier for future generations of learners to find answers to the most common questions. Related to that is the question of best practices. So in previous iterations, I've often been asked for best practices. And my answer has always been that there are no best practices yet because the language is so new. So this might not be completely true anymore. There are hundreds, if not thousands of projects on Cardano using Plutus. So there are some techniques that appear and, and seem to be used successfully, but nevertheless, there's no well-established collection of best practices yet. Another thing that makes Pluto somewhat unusual is the aforementioned EUTXO model. I really like the EUTXO model. I think it's, it's one of the greatest features on Cardano, but it takes some getting used to. So the so-called account-based model that Ethereum uses is more intuitive. I'm not saying it's easier necessarily, it's just somewhat more familiar. And I believe the EUTXO model has many advantages, both practical and theoretical. So it uh, allows for much higher security, for example. It's much easier to, to analyze contracts, but it takes some getting used to, especially if you have some experience with account-based blockchains and smart contracts. So you have to design your contracts differently if you want to take advantage of the unique features of Cardano. So that takes some getting used to. But as I said, I, I love it. I, I think it's a great model and it makes things in a lot of aspects much easier. So one nice feature of the EU takes O model is that it's deterministic in the sense that if you just look at your transaction and your contract in the context of this transaction, then you can completely deterministically decide or know what will happen once you deploy this transaction to the blockchain. It can still fail 
because your transaction can have an input that somebody else snatches away before your transaction gets there. But if it gets there, if all the inputs are still there, then it's completely deterministic what will happen. And this only depends on the transaction itself and its inputs and outputs. And that's totally different on Ethereum. On Ethereum, there's basically global state. So you can never predict locally what will happen globally once you deploy a transaction. And that has nasty side effects on Ethereum that, for example, you can end up paying gas fees and still have your transaction failing. That can never happen on Cardano. So on Cardano, you only pay transaction fees for a transaction if it actually succeeds. And in that case, you know in advance before you ever deploy it, what will happen, what the effect of this transaction will be. Another thing that made Plutus quite difficult in the past is Haskell. So Plutus has been implemented in Haskell and you write Plutus programs in Haskell. Though these days there are actually alternatives. So there are projects where you can use, for example, Python or Rust to compile to Plutus script. But nevertheless, the main way to write Plutus smart contracts these days is using Haskell. And Haskell, even though it's a beautiful language that I love, is not easy to learn for a lot of people. Again, not because it's necessarily more difficult than other languages, just because it uses a different model of thinking. So it requires you to think in a functional way and not in the more familiar imperative or object-oriented way. However, um, because we know that a lot of our pioneers were struggling with Haskell in the past, we have also tried to make that easier. So last year we released the Haskell Bootcamp that should teach you all the Haskell you need to know in order to write Pluto smart contracts. So I hope that those of you that are not familiar with Haskell have looked at this Haskell Bootcamp in preparation for this course. If not, of course, it's not too late. You can still have a look at, at some lectures of the bootcamp. Well, the good news is that in the past, what made Plutus difficult with regards to Haskell was mostly the off-chain part. So off-chain is querying the blockchain and constructing transactions, submitting transactions, so interaction with the blockchain. The on-chain part is the smart contracts themselves. Both is done in Haskell, or at least we mostly do it in Haskell, even though, as I said, these days there are alternatives. But the on-chain part is much simpler. So in principle, you just need very basic Haskell in order to write a Bluetooth smart contract. What used to be quite tricky was the off-chain part, because that used quite advanced Haskell features like type-level programming and uh, quite sophisticated monads and things like that. But luckily, due to the third-party tools that I mentioned before, we won't need those parts anymore for this course. So in principle, all you need is some basic Haskell knowledge in order to write the actual smart contracts. The rest, the interaction with the blockchain can be done with other languages or with simple Haskell. Another thing that makes Plutus tricky is to get the setup right because it has a lot of dependencies and those dependencies are often non-standard. For those of you that know Haskell, there is the standard Haskell library repository um, package. All the standard Haskell libraries can be found, but um, Cardano and Plutus use a lot of dependencies that are not to be found on Haskell, but just on some GitHub repos. And it was, always quite tricky to get all the dependencies work together and actually get a working version of Plutus. As I said before, we now have this collaboration with TX pipes, so you don't have to worry about that anymore. And also locally, we have this Docker file, this dev container that should get all the dependencies right. And Plutus is not changing so rapidly anymore. So in previous iterations of the course, Basically, every week we had to update the dependencies because there was active development happening that we wanted to reflect in later lectures of the course. But this time we hope to get away with one basic setup that we don't have to change for the duration of the course. So that should also be easier. Nevertheless, it can be somewhat tricky to get started in the first place. So as you can see, there are some challenges. I mean, the EOTXO model is somewhat unfamiliar and there's Haskell 
and the tooling is not yet ideal and the setup might be tricky. But as you can also see, we have worked very hard to try to make it as easy as possible for you. So we try to make the setup easy. The tooling is much better now. Um, Haskell isn't needed on such an advanced level anymore. So hopefully you will have a much easier experience than people that attended the first iterations of the program. So I hope in this course you will all learn a lot and that you will have a lot of fun and that after the course you will explore the possibility of, of Plutus because it's still so new that a lot of things haven't been tried and a lot of best practices still need to be discovered. So it's it's actually very exciting times because it's just the beginning and there are so many possibilities and so many things you can do with Plutus. And I hope this course will give you the necessary tools and skills to start exploring on your own. So I hope you all will enjoy the course. So next is, as mentioned before, Robertino's introduction to the setup, both on Demeter and locally, and then Thomas' demo on one of the things that's possible with Plutus.